لقد كان لكم في رسول الله أسوة حسنة لمن كان يرجو الله واليوم الآخر لمن كان يرجو الله واليوم الآخر وذكر الله كثيرا بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأصلي وأسلم على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد Dear brothers and sisters in Islam Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome to this new episode of the role model sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam Like any human being the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had feelings so he may get angry and he may become pleased and he may become happy and he may become sad. Sometimes the Prophet ﷺ would see things that astonish him, things that would amaze him and hence would make him a bit surprised whether these things are of Allah's creation and Allah's actions and doings, or whether they are from <coughs> someone else, his companions or anyone else. However, the Prophet ﷺ was never amazed by the adornment of this dunya because Allah told him this directly in the Quran, not to be fooled by what people possess in their hands, the adornments of this life. Don't be impressed by their wealth, their children, their health, the things that Allah gives to them in this life, because these are only a test. So the Prophet والسلام, was never impressed by worldly matters. Unlike us, when we see a fancy car, we're shocked. We turn our heads looking at it. When we see a beautiful mansion, a lavish lifestyle, a hefty bank account, we're amazed by it. Not the Prophet ﷺ. Because Allah brought him up وسلم, to not give any importance to such materialistic things. Once the Prophet ﷺ was given a garment made of silk. And for the Arabs, and non Arabs, even to us nowadays, the touch and feeling of silk is so soft and nice. So the companions kept on wondering. They were amazed by touching this soft fabric and how beautiful it was. So the Prophet ﷺ redirected their attention and he fixed the way they look at things by saying to them, do you like the feeling of this fabric? Are you amazed by it? By Allah. The handkerchiefs that Sa'd ibn Mu'adh, may Allah be pleased with him, has in paradise are much better and softer than this. And we know that Sa'd ibn Mu'adh, may Allah be pleased with him, died in the uh, uh, battle of the trench when he was hit by a, an arrow and no one knows who hit him with and he kept on bleeding from that injury for a whole month and then he died and the throne of Allah shook out of happiness when he died because he was coming to them as per the authentic hadith so the prophet وسلم, is telling them this is worldly issues neglect it don't be amazed by it think of the bigger picture Think of what lies ahead in Jannah if you're destined to enter it 
there will be much softer and better fabric than this. Allah Azza wa Jal, as stated, warned his Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam for being amazed or impressed by such things. Allah says, so let not their wealth or their children impress you. Allah only intends to punish them through them in worldly life and that their souls should depart at death while they are disbelievers. And also Allah says, and do not extend your eyes towards that by which we have given enjoyment to some categories of them. It's being but the splendor of worldly life by which we test them and the provision of your Lord is better than, uh, is better and more enduring. This is the attitude of Muslims. When you see the richest billionaire, when you see the lavish yachts or palaces they possess, we're not impressed. Good for you. Enjoy it while you can. It's a few years, a couple of decades, and another one bites the dust. You're six feet under, and then you'll get what's coming to you. As for us, we're terrified in this life. We enjoy whatever we can put our hands on, only if it's halal and pleasing Allah Azza wa Jal. And when we look at others, we could care less. Let them enjoy what they want because they're going to pay the price. And we are going to pay the price of whatever we earn unlawfully or we enjoy without having the concession from Allah Azza wa Jal to enjoy it. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam sometimes was amazed and impressed by Allah's actions. And this is to glorify Allah. When you're impressed of Allah's actions, this is to glorify Allah and to show that you're amazed by his creation and his actions. Once the Prophet Sallallahu said to his companions, don't you feel amazed how Allah Azza wa Jal deflects their insults to me, the people of Quraysh? Why? They used to nickname him Muthammam, meaning the insulted one, the one who's cursed. And he says, Allah deflected this by my own name, which is Muhammad, the name I was born with, and it means the praised one. So no matter how you insult the Prophet, no matter how you depict him, wanting to make fun of him or ridicule him, he is still on top. And you are a stinking corpse in a few years' time. Nothing you could do that would tarnish his reputation, alayhi His name is being called five times a day. Every single inch of earth, round the clock, 24 hours, seven days a week. His name is being called in every adhan, in every iqamah, in every prayer two billion Muslims offer to Allah Azza wa Jal. So you can't touch him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You can do nothing. He is the praised one. Allah has praised him and given him the beautiful name of Muhammad. Also, the Prophet ﷺ was amazed, astonished, shocked by how negligent ignorant people are. Aren't we all? We're all ignorant. We live our lives. We pass 20 years of age, 30, 40, 70, 80, and we still think that the energizer bunny is still ticking. We still have time. We still have credit. We're not going to die. And the Prophet ﷺ was amazed by this. And he said, I haven't seen anything like hellfire. Those running away from it, are deep asleep and I haven't seen like paradise those seeking it 
are deep asleep. So neither when you're afraid, you're running away. And neither when you are pursuing and seeking paradise, you're running to it. You're asleep. You're doing nothing. Also, the Prophet والسلام, shared with us his amazement of the disbeliever on the Day of Judgment when he stands in front of Allah Azza wa Jal to be held accountable and he says in defiance, no, I don't accept your records, O Allah, that show my sins and my disbelief. I need a witness. So Allah says, you have a witness from your own self and a witness from the angels. So his mouth is shut and his limbs are permitted to speak. So his hands, his legs, his body parts all speak and testify against him that yes, he did this and he did that. Then he's allowed to speak and to open his mouth and he would curse his own limbs. Damn you. I was defending you. I was trying to protect you. And all what I get is condemnation from you. You're testifying against me to Allah Azza wa Jal. And he's tossed in hell. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi also was amazed. And by the way, when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam sees something that amazes him or impresses him, he would say, Subhanallah. And this is how he would express his amazement, alayhi salatu wasalam. He was amazed once when Um Habiba, his wife, came to him once and said, O oh, Prophet of Allah, why don't you marry my sister? So the Prophet was shocked by this request and says, would you like this? Because usually jealousy would not allow a woman to want someone else to share her husband with her, let alone her own sister. So he said, would you like this? So she said, O Prophet of Allah, I'm not someone who does not want you, but I would love my sister to share this goodness that I am enjoying in this life. What could be better than the Prophet himself, alayhi So the Prophet, sallallahu said, this is not permissible for me. I can't join between two sisters. This is prohibited, as mentioned in chapter 4, Surah An-Nisa. And then he said, do not display your woman folk to me. Don't propose to me such things. Also the Prophet, when it was related to marriage, alayhi salatu wasalam, used to be shocked by the amount of dowry people pay. A man married a woman from the Ansar and gave her four ounces of silver. And we know silver is nothing, it's what? what? It's not that much. So the Prophet was shocked and said, alayhi salatu wasalam, four ounces of silver as if you are taking the silver from this mountain, meaning you're finding it, finding it freebies. You just take it and give it away, not having to work hard for it. And what would the Prophet say if he were to see how much dowry people are paying, how much expenses they are wasting over one night in a five-star hotel, or a wedding hall, throwing the money over food, over people who would, at the end of the night, condemn and consider that food was tasteless, not well cooked, not much salt or too much salt, despite all what you've spent to please them. The Prophet ﷺ also wondered how could people do such a thing? 
when they do not give Allah the proper estimate. He visited a man who was sick and really badly sick. And he was so sick that he was so thin that it was noticeable. So the Prophet ﷺ asked him, this is strange. Did you supplicate? Did you make any dua that is out of the ordinary? The man said, yes. I invoked Allah and said, oh Allah, whatever you were going to punish me for on the day of judgment, oh Allah, make it a punishment for me here in this life. So that when I come on the day of judgment, I have no sins to be punished for. And this is why he fell this sick. So the Prophet said, Subhanallah. This is the word. Subhanallah. Nobody can tolerate Allah's punishment in this life. Wouldn't you have said, Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana wa qina adab al nar? Why wouldn't you ask Allah for forgiveness and ask Him to give you something that is good in this life and the hereafter and to protect you from hellfire? Then the Prophet made dua for him and Allah cured him with His grace. Sometimes people, when it comes to illnesses, they don't appreciate Allah's power and ability. So once there was someone who's wounded. So the Prophet called the doctor. So the people around him said, Oh Prophet of Allah, what would medication do to him? And the Prophet was amazed by the response. He said, Subhanallah. Allah Azza wa Jal did not made an illness descend to earth without having a cure for it. So why are you so in despair of Allah's mercy? Every illness has a cure and a remedy for it, a healing for it. But not all people know you have to keep on looking. And the Prophet ﷺ would teach his companions if he sees something nice or hears something nice by expressing his amazement. Once he heard the man praying and he said in his prayer, and this is one of the dhikr in prayer, Allahu Akbaru Kabira, Walhamdulillahi Kathira, Wa Subhanallahi Bukratan Wa Asila. The Prophet said, I was impressed and shocked by what he has said because the gates of the heavens were opened for it. Ibn Umar says, After I heard this from the Prophet, I never left saying these words in my prayers. And also, the Prophet was amazed by peep, seeing people entering Jannah with shackles in their necks and hands. And we explained this in an earlier episode. And these were the captives of war who were taken into captivity as disbelievers. And while they were enslaved, they discovered Islam, accepted it, and this made them enter paradise because of their captivity. The Prophet ﷺ also expressed his amazement when two men from the East came and they delivered a speech in front of the Prophet ﷺ, pledging the, their allegiance to him, accepting Islam, so they introduced this with an oration, a beautiful, eloquent speech. The people were amazed by their eloquency, by their beautiful selection of words. And the Prophet said, alayhi salatu wasalam, some of the speech of people is a form of magic. And this is to express his amazement and how impressed he was by what they had said, praising that the choice of words can have the impact of magic. 
Of course, the good magic, not the bad, evil sorcery. And the Prophet والسلام, once was with his companions and all of a sudden he smiled and laughed. And he asked his companions, why wouldn't you ask me what's making you laugh of Prophet of Allah? So they said, what is making you laugh of Prophet of Allah? He said, I was amazed and impressed by the affair of the believer. All of his affair is good. If he was afflicted by a blessing and a favor of Allah, he would praise Allah Azza wa Jal and that would be good for him. But if he was afflicted by a calamity or a test or something that he does not like, he's patient and that is also good for him. And this is not for anyone except for the believer, which shows us that the affairs of a believer is always good, perfect, and he's always evolving and ascending in goodness, whether he's favored and blessed or he's tested and tried by Allah Azza wa Jal. He's always content. He's always praising Allah Azza wa Jal, and this can only be to a believer. Non-believers, disbelievers, don't share this. And that is why the Prophet was impressed and amazed by how tolerant and content a believer is with the predestiny and the divine decree of Allah, the Almighty. We have a short break. Stay tuned and inshallah, we'll be right back. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Today I'm going to talk about the book Interactions of the Greatest Leader. Abu Sa'id al Khudri radiallahu an narrated that the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, For every hardship, disease, worry, distress, harm, and grief that a Muslim faces, and even for every thorn that pricks him, Allah will expiate some of their sins through it. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu said, I entered where the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was and I found him suffering pains of a fever. And I said, O messenger of Allah, you are suffering severe pains of your fever. And he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Yes, I'm suffering as much as two men among you would suffer. I said to him, For that reason? Will you have two rewards? He sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Yes, it will be as you said. There is not a Muslim that is afflicted with the harm of a thorn or any above that, except that because of it, Allah will expiate their sins, and his sins will fall like leaves fall of a tree. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah and welcome back. Uh, we have uh, Umar from Italy. Assalamu alaikum, Shaykh. Assalamu wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. So, my question is that I read the surah of the people of the cave and I don't really understand the meaning or the moral. Can you clarify it, please? May yeah. Allah bless you. The whole surah, Umar? Yeah, come on, be realistic. What, what is it that you did not understand? No, just the fact that they were in the cave and then... They... Okay, the surah talks about four incidents. One of them is the people of the cave. And this shows us one of the trials that Allah Azza wa Jal would probably give to the Dajjal. The trials of religion. These were a group of youngsters. Seven in number, maybe less 
maybe more. Allah knows their number. And they were from reputable, wealthy families. And they found the belief in Allah as per their nature. While the whole community, the families, the kings, everyone around them were idol worshippers and committing shirk. So they decided to flee their environment, seeking refuge in Allah Azza wa Jal, to worship Allah alone. So they left in hiding, they went into a cave, and they had a dog with them, and they slept the night, not knowingly that Allah Azza wa Jal would make them sleep for centuries, 300 years and nine. And when they woke up, they were not changed. Everything was fine. So they thought that they slept the night. So they sent one of them with silver coins to go and bring them some food. They were starving, of course, after 309 years, unchanged. Allah protected their bodies not to be changed, not to show any signs of aging, not to decay. So they, the man went and he was shocked. Everything has changed. Of course, after 309 years, everything changed. The king, the environment, their families, their loved ones. So they came after investigation to know that these were their ancestors. And that was a sign from Allah Azza wa Jal to them. And the youngsters could not tolerate this. The story goes that they went back to the cave and they died. There are people who believed in Allah now as of the sign they had seen, wanted to build a masjid on top of their graves to commemorate them and to make them remember them. And the story goes on, as you know. So this was the moral of the story is that those who go to Allah Azza wa Jal and seek his protection, Allah will protect them. Not only that, he will make them a sign to the whole world that the world would be guided through them as well, and Allah will take care of them, and Allah knows best. Sulaiha from India. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. As alaikum, salam wa rahmatullah. Sheikh, I calculated zakah, and let's say, for example, it is $200. I give it a, I give it a poor person. I saw in Islam Q&A that the amount of zakah which should be given to poor and needy should suffice him for whole one year. So if I give that poor person more than $200, then that will exceed 2.5% calculation. So is it permissible to give that poor person only 2.5%? The thing you heard in Islam Q&A was referring to what suffices a poor person for a whole year. So if I were to be poor and what suffices me and my family throughout the whole year is $1,000, you can give me $1,000 or less. But if you said, oh, I'll give the sheikh $10,000 so that I would help him start to build a house. No, this is not allowed. This is too much. You're exceeding the need of the poor. And those who say, I have a relative, my uncle is poor, so I'm giving him $50,000 to build a house. Wait, wait, wait. This is not permissible. From the zakat, this is not permissible. This is an overkill. <clears throat> you can give him what is sufficient to maintain his livelihood for a whole year, paying his rent, giving him food for a whole year, not to make him wealthy by giving him $50,000 to build a house. Now he's wealthy. So this is not permissible. So your understanding is wrong. $250 is good as your zakat. You don't have to give him more to suffice for a whole year. No, this is your zakat, you give it. If you want to give some more, no problem. But if your zakat is $20,000 and he only needs $3,000 a year. You can't give him $5,000. The, the zakat is $20,000. You can't give him five, 
because this is over what he needs for a whole year. And I hope this makes sense. Abu Abdul Rahman from Italy. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, ya Sheikh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Before the question, I want to know which time a person can call you private? Which time and which, which day you want to be free to call you private? I, ha question I, I have only one mobile number, one phone number that I have, and I'm always available when I don't have counseling sessions, when I don't have lectures, when I don't have TV programs, and we don't, when I don't have things to do with the family like eating or sleeping. So basically speaking, you can call me any day uh, or night, 24 hours, seven. If I'm not available, you'll find it on do not disturb, it will give you busy, or you'll find it locked and, and, and uh, not on. So I don't have a, a specific time, Achi. Your question. Okay. Okay. The question is, the question is to pay the expiation. Can the person give money, or is to buy food to give to the poor person? Expiation of oath or someone who could not fast. Expiation of oath. Okay. So the expiation of oath is to one free a slave, two feed ten poor people from the medium food you eat usually, or three, clothe 10 poor people. These are financial expiations. You have to pay money. You cannot go to the poor and say, Akhi, this is $5, buy yourself a meal. This doesn't suffice. You have to buy actual food and give it to the poor. Or go to the imam of the masjid, or an organization you trust, who have knowledge, of the Sunnah and tell them this is $50 to feed 10 poor people. Buy them food. They said, yes, we don't give money to the poor for expiations. So you authorize them, you give them the cash, they buy food. But you cannot give money to the poor and ask him to buy food. This is not permissible. Um Maimuna from Bangladesh. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalam to Allah. My question is, I forgot that in Tashahud, there is Saad in as and Solihrin, but I pronounced it, uh, it as Sin. Are my previous prayers valid? Jazakallahu khairan. Wajazakum. Yes, your prayers are valid because the utterance of Salah, Salah is almost the same. It doesn't change uh, the meaning and people know that this is an, an accident and not intentional. So. It is valid, insha'Allah. Yusuf from Ghana. Assalamu alaikum, Ustaz. Alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. How are you, Sheikh? I'm fine, alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Sheikh, do you know how excitement it is whenever we call you one on one like this? Barakallah, fi exakallah khair. Don't do, be too excited, huh? Hmm. <laughs> alhamdulillah. Um, my question is about our previous lesson, concern about our role model. Um, you spoke about things that our prophet loved and also things that he used to smile or laugh at. Uh, please, was there any a Sahabi named Noam, if I'm not mistaken about it, and used to prank our prophet and sometimes it even go extreme? And also about things that our prophet loved. You okay, you, about you, you, know, you know you have one question. So your question was about a Noam, the, pro the companion of the prophet? Yeah, yes, but I think this is combined. That's no, 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 no. We will, t we will stop it here and inshallah ask a lot uh, later on, maybe if you have time at the end of the show or tomorrow, inshallah. And Nuaim was a prankster, a companion of the Prophet ﷺ that used to prank other companions. A lot of the stories narrated are not authentic, but... It was well known to historians that this companion used to do practical jokes. And at the same time, it was unfortunately known that this companion used to drink wine and be uh, whipped for it. Regardless of the many times that he was brought to the Prophet ﷺ, intoxicated, and the Prophet would rule that he would be whipped. 
40 lashes or 80 lashes, depending. But the, the majority was 40 lashes. So one incident that the companions saw him frequently coming to be flogged, they said, may Allah Azza wa Jal disgrace him. Many times he comes to be flogged like this. So the Prophet heard this and said, do not assist Satan over your brother. This is a calamity. This is a test. This is a weakness in him. So don't make dua against him and collaborate with Satan against him so that he would not feel despair and leave and do something more. Rather, make dua for him. And Allah knows best. Uh, um Amina from the Emirates. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. So my question is, after we pay Alisha with the Imam in the masjid, uh, do we have to pay the two rakah sunnah before the tarawih or the tarawih covers for the two rakah sunnah after Alisha? Jazakum alaykum. Wa jazakum. So the answer is, your tarawih do not cover for the two rak'ah sunnah ratibah mu'akkadah after the Isha prayer. These are two different things. And you cannot hit two birds with one stone because the sunnah of Isha is to be prayed and offered and this is separate from the taraweeh. Combining it with taraweeh would diminish and reduce your uh, reward and Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. Munib from the U.S. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Yeah, my question is, uh, in Ghusu, is it required that water reach the soft cartilage where the hard bone starts? Is it the minimum requirement or just water entering the nose does the job? We don't have a specific um, place to determine where the water should reach. In the hadith of Laqit ibn Sabura, may Allah be pleased with him, he stated that the Prophet والسلام, ordered him to exaggerate in rinsing his mouth, in inhaling water up his nostrils, unless he's fasting. So if you're, not, if you're fasting, don't exaggerate, which means that you just insert the water in your nose. How far? This is up to your preference and estimation. So just entering the water to the nose area would be sufficient, insha'Allah Azza wa Jal. And the more you do that and blow your nose with your left hand, that would be e even uh, better in following the sunnah. Khalilullah from Nigeria. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Now, um, Sheikh, um, uh, my home is close to the masjid where, uh, inshallah, I'll be performing my itikab, alhamdulillah. So, um, am, I, am I permissible to, to go home to have my bath and also take my meal from home? Not really taking it from home, just take it to the masjid for iftar and sahuk. Jazakumullah khayyam. I'tikaf is to force yourself to be in seclusion in the masjid and not to leave the masjid unless there's a necessity. What are these necessities? Answering the call of nature, having a bath uh, when uh, is mandatory or needed, to eat. If you can find someone to bring the food to your, to your place, then you have to do this. Because we know that if you leave the masjid and go home and check on the misses and the kids and see them, even for five seconds a day and go back to the masjid, it is joyful. So, no, if you have a servant or a neighbor or one of your kids who can bring you the food over to the masjid so that you don't have to leave the masjid, this is a must. Otherwise, then you can go and take it and go back immediately to the masjid. Abu Muhammad from the Emirates. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, Shaykh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Ramadan Mubarak, Shaykh. And to you as well. Yeah, Shaykh, my question regards to zakat. Uh, if I have money saving, okay, it's already one year finished. 
And also I have 40 grand gold. So my zakat amount, I have to pay for the money and for the gold or because the gold didn't achieve to 85 gram. That, that's my question. Okay, this is an issue of dispute among scholars whether we can combine gold to cash or silver to cash because the dispute in adding gold to silver is not strong. So if we don't have enough nisab or threshold of gold below 85 and the silver is below uh, 595 or one is more than the other, can we combine them together? The answer is no. But with cash, it's different. If I have 10,000 dirhams and 60 uh, uh, grams of gold, and if I combine them together, it would help the gold to reach the nisab, then I have to pay the zakat on both the gold that is below the threshold and the cash money. Likewise, with silver and cash, if I have 500 grams, only, not 595. But I have 10,000 grams, uh, 10,000 dirhams. I can compensate this, combine them, and give zakat for both their value. And Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. Bin Qurayshi from Pakistan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Uh, so she, I just heard in an answer that whatever suffices a poor for the whole year, you give your zakat according to that. Shaykh, if they just give someone enough to pay their child's tuition fee or buy some food for the week or something that will suffice them for the month, is that permissible or do we ask the categories how much they need? Because especially the relative due to dignity, they won't mention their need. Jazakallah khaira. Wa jazakum. I have stated this in my previous answer when I said that if your zakat money is $250, then you give them $250, which is beyond or below their need for a whole year. Their whole year, they need $3,000. But my zakat is two fifty, dollars so I give them two fifty. If my zakat is $10,000, I can give them whatever I want. I don't have to give them $3,000 that would suffice them for a whole year. I must not exceed $3,000. I have to limit it to $3,000. But sometimes my zakat is $10,000, and I deemed to give this poor person 500, another one 1,000, and another one 2,000. So it's not an obligation that, oh, I have to give the whole lump sum to an individual. I can estimate and evaluate according to my judgment, which is to be given and who to prioritize and how much. And I hope this answers your question. Faizan from Kashmir. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Hope you are fine, Sheikh. I'm doing great, Ya Rabbi, like alhamd. So, at the time of Maghrib, Adhan, we do iftar. And uh, right after two minutes, we hear another Adhan, which according to Hanafis, is the right time of Guru. So it becomes a conflict, as Hanafi says that the Salafis are uh, saying Adhan before Guru, and Salafi says that the Hanafis are saying Azan late after Guru. So which one should we follow? Just you should follow the first Adhan you hear, whether it's a Hanafi or a Salafi or whatever, as long as they're Muslims, the Adhan is an indication that the sun has set. Why would I believe Hanafis and not the Salafis? And why would I believe the Salafis and not the Hanafis? Allah told me to break my fast the moment the adhan is called, which is an indication that the sun has set. So this mu'adhan gives the adhan, I trust him, and I break my fast. I don't have to go to the top of my building and detect whether the sun has set or not. The adhan is sufficient. And don't listen to these feuds between these ignorant people. It is not going to pay off, and they just keep on yeah, the, uh, um, trying to gain territory and to have authority over people, leave it and let it be and just enjoy your dates and water. Khamis from the Emirates. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Is the sujood valid if hands are on the ground but next to the knees, the, the, 
that they're not next to the ears or shoulder, they're next to the knee. The Prophet وسلم, said, as in the hadith of Ibn Abbas, may Allah be pleased with the man with his father, I was ordered to prostrate on seven limbs. He said the forehead and pointed to his nose, meaning the forehead and the nose. The hands, the knees, and the feet. So the sunnah, as we know, is to place your hands and put your head in between them in sujood. And if you put them a little bit back next to your shoulders, that is even fine, no problem. If someone puts them next to his knees, this is not according to the sunnah. But did he prostrate on seven limbs? The answer is yes. Then the prostration is good, but he is not following the sunnah. Umar from the UK. Assalamu alaikum, Shaykh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Uh, so my question is, when I'm praying with the Imam Fajr, Maghrib and Isha, and uh, he's reading out loud, um, and I know that you can listen and you don't need to recite anything, but what about if I want to recite Surah Fatiha and Masura, when would I recite it? So the answer would be, you cannot recite the Fatiha while the Imam is reciting it. So when he says, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, you say, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. This is not permissible. What is permissible is when he concludes his Fatiha by saying, Ghayr al-Maghdubi alayhim wa Ameen. You say Ameen and you begin reciting the Fatiha. If he starts to recite the following Surah, there's no problem. You can also continue to recite your Fatiha quickly, conclude it, and then listen to it. If you don't recite the Fatiha at all, according to the most authentic opinion, your prayer is totally valid because his recitation in loud uh, rak'ahs is sufficient for himself and for you as well. Ayan from Pakistan. Assalamualaikum, Sheikh. Assalamualaikum. So, Sheikh, I've got this problem of urine incontinence uh, from the last, uh, I think, around two to three years, uh, which has caused me enough trouble in my life. Uh, I, it's uh, everything, almost everything seems impure to me. So, uh, I have the question that uh, how can I differentiate between pure and impure things? Because everything in my house seems impure to me, like the sofa, the clothes, etc. Okay, Ayan, you have to acknowledge that the goal of Satan is to mess up with your head. All what Satan wants is to make life difficult for you. Now, is Islam a religion of simplicity and ease or a religion of hardship and difficulty? No Muslim on earth would say it's a religion of hardship and difficulty. It is definitely a religion of simplicity and ease because Allah stated in the Quran that he does not want to burden us in religion. Allah made things easy in Islam, very easy. So now my question to you, the way you're practicing your Islam, is it easy and simple? The answer is no. You'll say that no, I find my life hard and difficult. Everything I see is, is najis. My sofa, the light switch, the doorknobs, my clothes, the kitchen utensils. This is not Islam which you're practicing. This is another religion. So don't fool yourself. Shaitan has messed up with your head. You are following and obeying him. It's your mistake. All what he does is to call you and you're responding and answering. So you have only yourself to blame. What to do? You have to stop this nonsense immediately. Go back to the basics. Everything on earth is pure until proven otherwise. Do you have proof? Can you see it? Can you smell it? Definitely you're got, not going to taste it. If it not, then it's pure. Maybe, Sheikh, I think, I feel all of this is doubtful. Certainty is not affected by doubt. And Allah Azza wa knows best. This is all the time we have for today's episode. Until we meet tomorrow, inshallah, I'll leave you for Amanillah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. 
لقد كان لكم في رسول الله أسوة حسنة لمن كان يرجو الله واليوم الآخر لمن كان يرجو الله واليوم الآخر وذكر الله كثيرا